In September 1962, President John Kennedy toured the McDonnell Aircraft Plant in St. Louis. As the country's space program was moving from the single astronaut Mercury capsules to the two-person Gemini program. Kennedy had set the bold goal, put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, and St. Louis was building the capsules taking the first Americans into space. We kind of had a saying that it was the Model T of the space world. The goal of the moon landing would be reached July 20th, 1969, 50 years ago. And the role of this city and its engineers and technicians would play no small part in getting us there. I'm Jim Kircher, and July 20th is the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing. So, of course, there are all kinds of articles and programs and documentaries, including the PBS series Chasing the Moon. But for us, well, this is a local story, because in the early days of the space race, St. Louis played a big role. So this summer, we spent time going through our archives to tell the story about what St. Louis did and about the people who did it. St. Louis had been in love with flight since the days of the World's Fair. It wasn't just balloons, but balloons that could be controlled and steered over a set course. Scott Field became an airship base after World War I, but even by then, it was clearly the age of the airplane. Small airlines were operating out of Lambert Field, and manufacturers were building planes in St. Louis. Local businessmen and aviation enthusiasts backed airmail pilot Charles Lindbergh's bold plan to fly solo across the Atlantic from New York to Paris. It was local money that put the city's name on his plane. Lindbergh completed the flight in 1927 in the spirit of St. Louis. But it was World War II that brought defense contracts to airplane builders, including a small startup run by James McDonnell, which got contracts for parts. But it was after the war and into the Cold War era that McDonnell Aircraft grew as a builder of jet planes for the military. And then something happened in 1957 that shocked the country. The Soviet Union announced that one of its rockets had successfully put the first satellite into orbit. It wasn't just about a satellite, it was about the rockets. Rockets powerful enough to reach space or to deliver a nuclear warhead halfway around the world. The late John Yardley, a McDonnell executive who would play a key role in the space race, talked with us at McDonnell Douglas headquarters in 1995 and said he was not as surprised about Sputnik as the general public. It didn't impress me as much as it impressed the world. And I said, well, you know, we're going to do that next, next January. We had a, we, not McDonnell Douglas, but the International Geophysical Year was going on. And, and uh, the United States had the charge to in, uh, try an artificial satellite. And the Navy was doing it. It was called Vanguard. And uh, uh, when the Russians sent it off, well, what's the big deal? We're going to do it next. Well, the big deal was that Vanguard went clunk. <laughs> There were a number of failures during the year, and the United States promptly announced them. The first and most spectacular of these was Vanguard at the end of 1957. There were other Vanguard failures, all achieved takeoff, but trouble occurred either in the second or third stages. Explorers 2 and 5, Beacon, and Pioneer 2 were also considered unsuccessful experiments. This thing sort of catapulted the Russians into that leadership, and nobody liked it. And everybody thought it was worth uh, money to put our technical capability into doing this. And it was <clears throat> a month or so before our top management uh, reacted and it's got a feel for what might happen and what they ought to do, and that's when I got transferred. So that changed what you were doing. Yes, yes. Space 
as a as a business was not thought to be coming for a long time when the Russians orbited the Sputnik and everybody got excited about it and there are all sorts of recriminations of how come we let them get ahead of us and let's get going on this thing. We all jumped on the bandwagon because we really believed we should get ahead of the Russians. A and B, it was potential business. In the late 1950s, McDonnell Aircraft found itself in a new business manufacturing this country's first space capsules. Mercury's primary purpose was to establish that you could fly men successfully in space. Gemini's uh, task was to fly two men at a time and to, to uh, test things like uh, extravehicular activity, uh, rendezvous, docking, and things of that nature. Now, it was imperative to get this done quickly in order to get to the moon this decade, which President Kennedy had, had made a target. And as such, we couldn't use a whole lot of new technology unless it were almost ready. So we did the job with what we could. Mercury had, I'd say, absolutely no advanced technology. Gemini did have a phased in a flight computer and <clears throat> fuel cells and other things of a, of a higher technology because they had more time. Years later, after successful visits to the moon and during the era of the space shuttle, we were invited to a reunion in St. Anne, a reunion of the men and women whose names we don't know, but who were responsible for the lives of the first American astronauts. Everybody knew the first American astronauts, the Mercury 7 they called them, Shepard, Grissom, Glenn, Shira, Slayton, Carpenter, Cooper. But thousands of other people were involved in this. Okay, uh, John. When an astronaut climbed into the Mercury capsule, he was climbing into a craft built in St. Louis by workers at McDonnell Aircraft. And the last people the astronauts saw before blastoff were McDonnell employees who bolted on the hatch. That's you here, right? Yeah, this is me here with my back. Hair was a little darker. Cal Mosher came up from Texas for this reunion. He had worked with the space capsules after they arrived at Cape Canaveral to prepare them for the space shots. We're just doing some modification and putting some brackets on for some wiring. And this is this was before uh, John Glenn's flight. McDonnell Aircraft signed the contract to build America's first space capsules for manned flight in 1959 and some here were part of it from the very beginning. What were you doing when you got called into this project? I was working on uh, the F-101, and it phased out in 1958. And after that phased out, they said, uh, you're going to get transferred over to a new program. Originally, they took us all off the airplane line. They sort of skimmed off the best, started astronautics, and then we all worked from there. What were your thoughts at the time? I didn't think it worked. <laughs> McDonnell built jet planes, but space capsules had to withstand greater stresses. The blast off, the vacuum of space, the intense heat of re-entry, and the splashdown in the ocean. McDonnell's contract was for 20 capsules. Only seven were planned for manned flights. The others would be used for various tests including flights with chimps on board. The capsules were small, just nine feet high, six feet in diameter at the base. Just enough room for a single astronaut who could do little more than move his head and arms. It made it a challenge for those who built these capsules. As work progressed and the capsule filled with equipment and controls, only one worker at a time could get inside with progressively less room to maneuver. It was demanding work. We were trying to catch up to the Soviet Union in the space race, and they would put the first man into orbit around the Earth. And we were always, always rushed, always pressed, long hours, good crew, you know, and everything was being done for the first time. Now you gotta remember now, back there, uh, everything was slide rule and pencil. And then came testing, more testing than had ever before been given a manned vehicle. The first manned spacecraft was delivered in December 1960. 
only 23 months after the company had received the contract. Now the Those involved remember the demanding deadlines the and the, the long hours, but they also the remember the teamwork, the dedication, the problem solving. They were pioneers. No one had been here before. No one could tell them how to do it. And I imagine every space program built on what you guys did. Yes. And we kind of had a saying that it was the Model T of the space world. And back then you didn't have all the red tape that you had to go through 15,000 signatures to get something done. And we did it, you know, it was all just done like that. Well, you can't, later on in the programs you couldn't do like that because it got too involved. It was February 20th, 1962, that John H. Glenn entered his spacecraft. Something else the they couldn't do after those first few space flights adventure. was hide souvenirs inside the space capsule. Not after they got caught. The ground crew would stash dollar bills before blastoff. They'd be signed by crew members and astronauts and framed, verified as having orbited the Earth. Signed by John Glenn. Yeah. NASA officials were none too happy when they found out. Yeah, right. It was scandal. Remember that? The guys coming down and uh, investigating the dollar bills and the two dollar bills. I wasn't in on it. In on it. Don't you lie to me, you were in on it. He is the one, Joe is the one that logged all of these That's Joe Trammell on the right. He hosted this reunion. So if His memories of those important and exciting times are slipping away. He's in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease and he wanted to see his old friends while he still remembered them. His wife, Ruth, made all the arrangements. Go ahead. I really appreciate you people coming out for this and being with us. The best group in the world. I love all of you. God bless you. We love you, John. We love you. One minute, buddy. It's been a long time since the first days of the space program. They remember the good things now and mostly laugh at the bad. They're proud of what they did and proud of how well they did it. I had so much faith that the, we built it, it was going to work. And uh, that's what I went on. You know, we just, instead of saying, oh boy, I worry about this and worry about that, we, we, we knew when it was ready to launch that the, the spacecraft was ready to go because everybody had done their job. And I know that the way it was put together and the way the mission worked out, there was more went into it than just a wage that you were earning here in the plant. Your hearts went into it as ours did down at the Cape, too. John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth and later a U.S. Senator, was invited to the reunion but sent his regrets. In a handwritten note to Joe Trammell, he wrote, They were great days none of us will ever forget. It was a great team we were all part of, and we did a good job for this country. And I can imagine no action, no adventure, which is more essential and more exciting than to be involved in the most important and significant adventure that any man has been able to participate in in the history of the world. And it's going to take place in this decade. And I congratulate you on what you have done, and I congratulate you on being part of this adventure. Thank you. I'm just thankful I was part of it now, even though I was kind of apprehensive when I first started. But now, the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Joe was the catalyst that brought us all back together. A lot of us have died. We have members that are 91 that just couldn't make it. And uh, most of us have one illness or another, but it put us back together probably for the last time. The Mercury 7 astronauts would often come to the St. Louis plant to observe and advise. One of the most popular was Virgil Gus Grissom. He would later die with two other astronauts in the Apollo 1 fire. But he flew in the second Mercury suborbital flight and then in Gemini. He was the first American who went into space twice. <laughs> <laughs>
When Gus Grissom came to St. Louis, he would stop in to see his little brother Lowell, who was working in another McDonald division at the time. He still lives in the area, and over his fireplace is a copy of a Norman Rockwell painting of his brother and John Young preparing for the Gemini flight. Well, it's, uh, it's really amazing to me that uh, these men, with so little knowledge about what was going to happen, what had to be done, uh, that uh, they were able to pick somebody that would do this. And I know uh, in my early days at McDonald, I worked right across the hallway from where they were building the uh, heat shield for Mercury. And talking to the engineers that were doing that, they had no idea how thick that heat shield had to be. So it, it took a very special person to, uh, to do this thing. And, uh, it was very interesting. It was a fun place to be. Uh, the astronauts were always coming in, and of course, when they appeared, uh, it was pandemonium around the place. But uh, it was uh, interesting, fun times to be there. And Gus came quite a bit, I understand, right? During he was both there, Mercury and Gemini. Yes, he was there uh, quite a bit. In fact, uh, he spent the summer of 1964 there uh, when they were building Gemini. and. He had so much to input into that vehicle that the other astronauts ended up calling it the Gusmobile. <laughs> so this summer, 50th anniversary of the moon landing. This must be a special summer for you, bring back a lot of uh, memories? Yes, it does. Uh, knowing that uh, Gus had a lot to do with uh, that event occurring, it, it's very special. He might have been the guy who first landed on the moon. I mean, if, if, if things had been different. He was told by Deke Slayton, who uh, was the man that was responsible for assigning the crews for flights, that uh, he would have an excellent chance of becoming the first man on the moon. They actually wanted one of the original Mercury 7 to be the first man, so, uh, and he was the likely candidate. So tell me a little bit uh, about your brother. I mean, he was your big brother. He was my big brother. He yeah. was uh, eight years older than me. Uh, I have a sister and uh, another brother uh, between us. So it takes a certain personality to be, well, he was a fighter pilot, he was a test pilot, and then to be an astronaut. There's risk taking, there's the love of speed probably, what, what attracted him, do you think, to, to that business? He always had a fascination with flying uh, from very early age that I recall. Did he ever question whether it was the right decision to no, get into I, the space I program? No, I think he, was, he very willingly went into it. I think he looked at it as uh, a continuation of his career from being a, a, a fighter pilot to a test pilot to uh, just an extension of what he had been doing and uh, a chance to do something that had never been done before. Yeah, and these guys were competitive as well. There, there had to be some egos involved. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, when it came time to select the first man, I guess there was a lot of uh, discussion. And I don't think there were hard feelings, but I think there were all seven of them thought that they should be the one. Gus Grissom went up in the Liberty Bell 7 Mercury capsule for a suborbital flight, just up into space and down. John Glenn would be the first American to orbit the Earth in the next flight. But Grissom's flight is best remembered for what happened when he splashed down. The plan was for a helicopter to retrieve the capsule with the astronaut inside and bring it back to an aircraft carrier. But instead, after splashdown, the hatch blew off, an emergency measure that wasn't supposed to happen. The capsule started filling with water. Grissom crawled out. The capsule sank, and Grissom was pulled from the water. Malfunction? Human error? That was never conclusively determined. What's your version of that story, or what was Gus's ver version of that story? Well, first of all, he was very adamant that he had nothing to do with it blowing, and uh, it always uh, seemed a little ridiculous to me to think that he panicked after you've uh, set in this spacecraft on top of a rocket, got blown into space, 
and went gone through reentry, and your parachutes opened, and you're down in the water. Uh, doesn't seem like the time you would panic to me, I, but uh, oh, there's several different uh, uh, theories on why that hatch blew, and I don't think any of them were able to to be proven as the the source. But uh, uh, you know, it's one of those things that happened. And uh, Gus, uh, apparently NASA spent uh, uh, put a lot of faith into Gus because they picked him to make the first Gemini flight and the first Apollo flight. So uh, I think they knew that he had nothing to do with the blowing. Before his third space flight, Gus Grissom was killed with two others in the Apollo 1 fire. We'll talk more with his brother in a bit about that and the role he and others play in keeping the story alive. The real contest that was, that was um, envisioned, correctly or not, was a race for supremacy in the minds, hearts and minds of the world for technical uh, leadership. And that's what the United States couldn't bear. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody was saying, they saw the Russians do it, they looked over the U.S. and, what are you guys doing? <laughs> so I think that's really what happened. After the Russians put Sputnik into orbit in 1957, McDonnell Aircraft put Yardley in charge of the design and construction of the spacecraft for the Mercury and Gemini flights. These were the stepping stones to the moon. Yardley would later be involved in developing the space shuttle. John Glenn called him one of the real pioneers of the space program. And in 1995, Yardley had this assessment of what was called the space race. And uh, where it's going from where we are today, I don't know, but I think it's been good for the country to do what we have done. Uh, the uh, Apollo landing was, was clearly uh, a worldwide event, uh, telecast all over the world. And uh, the, uh, the reaction was really staggering. And there was no question then who was in the leadership. The Russians quit their program. You know. Certainly, I guess the space race was as much a uh a technological race as, as, as it was a public relations race. Yeah, but I think nobody would have done it for the technological parts if it hadn't been for the political parts. Fifty years ago this July, Americans got to the moon first. And by first, of course, we mean before the Russians. It had been a space race. And Russia had put the first man into orbit, the first woman into orbit, and before that, the first satellite. The news of Sputnik is often described as this sudden jolt, a shock to America. And yet McDonnell engineer John Yardley in 1995 told us that it actually took a while to sink in took a while for America to change gears. Well, it seems uh, very sharp in, in retrospect. Now, in case of actual fact, I'd say it took six months to really coagulate the thinking and that the politicians know what they wanted to do and the fight start in the Congress and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it, it wasn't daily. I mean, a lot of people read that, who cares? But once they started reading the editorial pages and looking at the television, they said, you know, we're getting, we're getting the reputation of second-class citizens in technology, which Americans don't want. As a builder of jet planes, McDonnell Douglas was ready to bid on and win the contract for the first space capsules. Its role in the early days of the space race came at a time when St. Louis was redefining itself with the modern centerpiece of its new image, the Gateway Arch, going up on the riverfront. President Johnson visited St. Louis to mark its 200th anniversary in 1964. You faced a hard choice, and you made it. The people of St. Louis chose progress, not decay. A new spirit of St. Louis was born, and today you look to the future with new pride and with new confidence. There was more to St. Louis's image as a city on the move than its new riverfront monument. 
St. Louis now had a big part in the great adventure of the 1960s, and it was helping the country to catch up to the Soviet Union in the space race. McDonnell Aircraft had won the contract in 1959 to build the Mercury capsules that carried the first Americans into space. And President John F. Kennedy had set the goal of reaching the moon by the end of the decade. The president himself came to the plant in 1962 as the space program entered the next phase, the two-man voyages of the Gemini capsules. And I can imagine no action, no adventure, which is more essential and more exciting than to be involved in the most important and significant adventure that any man has been able to participate in in the history of the world. And it's going to take place in this decade. And I congratulate you on what you have done, and I congratulate you on being part of this adventure. Thank you. Kennedy was given a tour of the plant by James McDonnell, who had started his company in 1939 with just one employee. It had built aircraft for World War II, Korea, the Cold War, and now for space travel. We were sticking our necks out. This is flying men in a hostile environment that nobody knew much about, and we never lost a man. And uh, that is true for other contractors who've been in this place. There would be tragic deaths in the coming years. Three killed, Grissom, White, and Chaffee, in the Apollo capsule fire during a test in 1967. Later, the Challenger space shuttle disaster in 1986, and the Columbia space shuttle breaking up on re-entry in 2003. Gus Grissom's brother, Lowell, a McDonnell Douglas retiree who lives in O'Fallon, has served on the board of the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. His brother's death, along with the other two Apollo astronauts, was in its own way a turning point in the space program. There were a lot of things wrong with that spacecraft, and Gus knew it. Uh, my folks were down at the Cape two weeks before the accident happened, and uh, Gus told them that uh, even though it was supposed to be an open-ended mission, he didn't think it would ever go more than three orbits. But he was very frustrated because uh, he was frustrated with the communication system that prompted him to say, how do you expect to hear me from the moon when you can't hear me from three buildings away? And apparently the wiring was uh, just uh, really a problem. They had 30 miles of wiring around that spacecraft. And, uh, of course, it was supposed to be insulated, so there was no spark, but it did happen. Were you or the family <clears throat> angry about what happened and why it happened? I was angry because I had talked to Gus and I knew how hard he had tried to get these things fixed. And uh, he said that when they were building Gemini and Mercury in, here at McDonald in St. Louis, that if something was wrong, he could go to Mr. Mack and things got fixed in a hurry. And with North American, he didn't have that contact to get things fixed that really needed to be fixed. The Apollo 1 fire came after a steady string of successful American space flights, but now the public and politicians realize just how risky this could be. Well, that's true. And I think uh, that there was what they call go fever uh, that uh, the astronauts and the engineers and NASA all were in a hurry to get this done. And of course, uh, uh, President Kennedy had uh, said that we're going to get to the moon in the decade of the 60s, which uh, really forced uh, these people to work harder and faster and smarter to get there. But this, the accident, the fire, and the deaths not only of Gus, but of, of White and Chafee, did it force the space program to slow down and, 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 and maybe be a little more careful and, and push a little bit less? Well, Michael Collins, who was on the crew that went to the moon on, in uh, Apollo 11, said we made it to the moon not in spite of Apollo 1, but because of Apollo 1. 
And the fact that the accident happened on the ground where they could actually determine the things that were wrong with that spacecraft and get them fixed, uh, without that, uh, most people don't believe we would ever made it to the moon in the 60s. Yeah, it might have happened on another mission. And if it had happened in space, you know, they wouldn't have had the data, uh, the actual hardware there to examine to determine what really went wrong. The space race has always been about technology and risk, and it came with achievement and adventure and inspiration. Lowell Grissom has also been an advisor to another organization that is preserving those stories, something that grew from one man's passion and determination. And Paul Shankman went to meet the man who early on got attached to the space story and never let go. For hundreds of years, Bonterre, Missouri has been all about what used to go on here underground. But these days, people here are thinking more about what's overhead, thanks to a longtime resident who believes the sky is truly the limit. I don't have a problem with a whole lot of people, but I have a problem with people who talk a lot and do nothing. Earl Mullins is not just a talker. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. He had a dream to build a space museum in Bonterre. So in 2003, Earl took over the building that had once been the city's water department and flooded it with items from his personal collection of space memorabilia. But launching the museum was a challenge. Uh, here's the way that about. Like Apollo 13, Earl's space museum seemed destined to be a successful failure. Went one and a half years and nobody stepped through the door, not one. But Earl never gave up. And today, the Space Museum is on a much better trajectory. We've been at this for 18 years. It's just now beginning to blossom. That balloon will soon be hurtling across the sky a thousand miles high over North America. Earl's fascination with space began in the early 1960s, when he was just a kid, intrigued by an early experiment in satellite communication called Project Echo. You can fire up the transmitter. Right. I spent a lot of time in the front yard looking up in the sky, and I saw this thing. It was Echo, and I was had. From then on, Earl began collecting anything he could find related to space, whether based on fact or fantasy, starting with this Project Mercury pencil sharpener he won at a carnival. The first pieces to go on display here came from Earl's personal collection. There are real cosmonaut gloves, and so-called satellite shoes. Even the soap dispenser in the restroom is out of this world. One reason that I went into the Space Museum business so I could get my hands on more stuff. And he has. Earl estimates his personal collection today is worth at least a half million dollars. But that's only the beginning. We are in possession. It's going on $23 million worth of NASA stuff. Even before it opened, it was clear the one thing the Space Museum lacked was space. So in 2014, work began on a new addition, built by some of the same men who helped build the space program itself. Project Mercury had officially begun. St. Louis-based McDonnell Douglas played a critical role in the space race, and it was a team of retired Mac engineers, all in their 80s, who came to Bonterre every weekend for almost four years to work with other volunteers and donors to create an annex in an adjacent building named in memory of Gus Grissom, one of the Mercury 7 astronauts who later died in a fire aboard Apollo 1. We're really not done, Paul. We're adding artifacts uh, nearly every two or three months as, as NASA makes them available. It is a space shuttle main gear tire. There were four of these and then two smaller tires on the nose. That's a piece of heat shield off of Apollo 8 lunar rover fenders. That's actually the keys to the space shuttle. There is also a piece of Skylab that fell to the Earth in Australia and a separated Saturn V engine inlet found in the ocean that possibly came from Apollo 11. You know, Paul, most people think that uh, the white on the shuttle is paint, and it really is not. 
It's, uh, there is a coating on there, and this is it. It's a ceramic fiber or blanket. If you were to look at the shuttle up close, it would look like a patchwork quilt. But the museum's most prized flown item is this small flag taken into space by Gene Cernan, the last American to walk on the moon. It either stayed in the spacecraft that orbited the moon or it went with him and it could have literally been on the surface of the moon. Don't tell me, let me guess. This is the space toilet. It is the space toilet and frankly it's one of the uh, most often asked questions how to use the bathroom in space. The water is extracted, recirculated, and you use it again. For the toilet? No. For? Yes. At one time, there had been talk about moving the museum to St. Louis, and for a brief time, part of it did move to Branson. Unfortunately, we were a small fish in a big pond down there. Up here, we kind of like to think of ourselves as a big fish in a small pond, so we'll see. Basically, the reaction we get is in Bon Terre, really. To which Earl responds, why not? After all, Bon Terre is French for good earth, and it was also where swing-away can openers were made, the brand used aboard the first U.S. space station. We really like to think that we're about more than the artifacts. We're about a way of thinking. We're about dreaming big, pushing the boundaries, uh, uncovering problems, and then solving those problems. It's a Michelin, <laughs> for crying out loud. For Earl, the goal has always been to turn visitors into enthusiasts, like Debbie House, a retired nurse who came to the museum looking for work as a volunteer. Today, she is the administrative assistant. The very first thing he talked to me after, you know, you go through the regular who you are and what you've done, and he'll say, do you know when we landed on the moon? And I said, no. He said, then obviously you don't know who landed on the moon. And I said, no. He said, do you care? I said, nope. But I'm going to tell you something. I have fallen in love with this. This is my passion. I want to know more. I try every day to learn more. Godspeed, John Glenn. There is an illustration on the wall here, which includes a quote from astronaut John Glenn that seems an apt description of what the Space Museum is all about. He said it may be that those who dream the most do the most. Or put another way, creating the Space Museum was one small step for mankind, thanks to one giant leap by a man. It's about doing noble things. It's about reaching out of your comfort zone, thinking about things more than just yourself, and doing something for humanity. And leave a legacy. Leave more than you take. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Every once in a while, it occurs to me that there are members of the human race who do not live on the planet Earth. It's been that way going on 20 years now. People living in shifts on the International Space Station orbiting the Earth. Scott Kelly spent almost a year straight up there, the longest of any American. So when he came to St. Louis to promote his book, this was a guy I had to meet. And I actually wasted the first 13 years of my education looking out the window. Or when you read his book Endurance, you find out a lot about Scott Kelly about how he was a disinterested, distracted student, and how the book about the Mercury astronauts, The Right Stuff, sent him on a path to become a naval fighter pilot, a test pilot, and an astronaut. And then how he was chosen to spend nearly a full year on the International Space Station, while his identical twin brother Mike remained on Earth as a control. And there were some interesting changes noted on the genetic level that are still being studied. But what NASA really wanted to know was in what ways a year in space might damage a human being, and how that would have to be addressed before sending people off to Mars. And Scott Kelly's year in space would be no walk in the park. When we see the space station, it looks like this beautiful floating object 
when we see you guys doing spacewalks, it looks so peaceful. There's a heck of a lot more involved than, than, than that sense of tranquility. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, you know, the space station, it's not only our home when we're living in space, but it's also our workspace. It's a laboratory. It's a garage. It's, uh, you know, a living room, dining room. It's a bathroom. And, of course, you do have your privacy. There's a little door. So other people know that you're in there. So, you know, like those kind of... Um, you know, facilities on Earth, they're not always the, uh, especially when you have people living in them, living in them they're not always the, uh, the nicest places. Um, it is a magical place, it's, uh, but, you know, I think maybe the way I described it in, in, the, in the book is, is different than, like you said, than what your impression of it was. And then, of course, you know, the spacewalks are not peaceful. No, that's what struck me, is how difficult. Tell me what, what, a, what a stress or strain, physical strain, doing a spacewalk is. Because again, you don't see it from the outside. You know, they've, in, uh, in the pool, when we practice them, which is actually easier than what you do in space, they measure our metabolic rate and we expend more energy than if you run a marathon. So it's work. I don't, they, I don't think they should call it space walking, they should call it space working. And uh, because of the suit and the way it's designed and how the joints move and it's pressurized and how difficult it is to work with in the gloves, it's, uh, it's, it's a real chore. And, but, and you're spent afterwards. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And not only physically, but also emotionally because you're outside in space in a vacuum. You realize, at least at some point, I realized while I was doing this that, you know, it's just you and your spacewalking buddy out there, and there's no one to help you if anything else, if anything goes wrong. Now we're going to take you um, uh, Zenith. Here we go. Everything going. Spacewalks are fascinating to watch, but most of the other chores they have are not. Their days are full of routine and sometime emergency maintenance and overseeing many, many experiments, some for NASA about space travel, and others for scientists who want their experiments carried out in a near weightless laboratory. Being on the space station is a job. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's why we're up there, to figure all this stuff out. Part of an astronaut's job is instructing, educating, and entertaining those of us on Earth, like when Kelly and his crewmates sampled lettuce grown on the space station. And this sort of thing is also good PR. Hi, this is Scott Kelly aboard the International Space Station. I wanted to... Uh, NASA is streaming video, often live, 24 hours a day from the space station. In addition to everything else, astronauts have to be good at this. And like everything else they do, it is tightly scheduled. I guess I never realized, I knew you were up there doing yeah. stuff, but I didn't know how much yeah. and how busy you really were. Yeah, people don't realize that, you know, right before that interview, you've probably been scrambling you know for the first six hours of the day just trying to keep up with the timeline and then you set up the camera it takes you like a minute to point it in the right direction you show up in your spot like 30 seconds before you go live and as soon as it's done you're off to the next thing although Kelly is now a retired astronaut he and his brother are still being tested to determine any long-term effects his time on the space station had on him the 340 days would be more than enough time for a trip to Mars. In his book, Scott Kelly describes one blunder he made, which fortunately did not put anyone in danger. On a spacewalk, he had left a break on a moving part, and he had to do an extra spacewalk to get back out and free it up. You're so well trained yeah. in so many things, in knowing all of these systems. And yet, the chance of human error is always going to exist. Oh, human error is one of the most, uh, is like the most significant reason we have accidents in, in aviation. As you know, if you use aviation as an example, almost all the time there's a crash. It's because someone messed it up. And you know, I wanted this book to not only be about the great things and you know, to talk about how you know, magical and spectacular spaces, but I also wanted to be a human story. So, you know, admitting mistakes, telling, you know, whether it's in, you know, uh, in, in space, mistakes by me, or even in my personal life, 
or you know just things that are not uh, I think that a lot of other astronaut biographies don't have in them I thought was helpful because it then it shows the, the whole story not just the good stuff I like some free I can turn it with my hand so that looks good okay nice work the International Space Station, that's old news, up there already for nearly a generation. And the moon landings to today's young people, it's what Lindbergh's flight was to baby boomers. History, before my time. When it comes to space exploration today, we're looking beyond the moon to the planets. And there's a new generation of explorers and engineers, including a St. Louis native who is helping us get there. Her name is Brooke Harper, and if you don't recognize the name of the face, you might remember her from this video. Touchdown confirmed. When the InSight spacecraft landed on Mars November 26th of last year, the aerospace engineer who grew up in Chesterfield went to Parkway Central with engineering degrees from Mizzou and Georgia Tech, celebrated with her colleague, and became an internet sensation. It's, it's all a blur to me now, to be honest. It was just such a, a high and an emotion that I've never felt in my life. It, it was just surreal is the word that I keep using. As a systems engineer, you live in paranoia until, <laughs> until a spacecraft is safely on the ground. Yeah, those of us who are following this, we sort of assume it will work, but if you think back, there have been projects that have literally crashed and burned or disappeared or lost contact with. Correct, yeah. There was a uh, about a 40% success rate at Mars, so, you know, less than half. There were a lot of people, of course, who made it happen, the people who designed and built InSight. Zero. The team in charge of the launch and the separation to begin the long journey to Mars. That worked, and they celebrated. A lot of excited people. InSight would travel for six months, and it didn't have to just get to Mars. It had to enter the atmosphere at just the right angle. Too shallow, and it bounces off into space. Too steep, and it burns up. They got the angle right, and that's when the EDL begins. Entry, descent, and landing. Brooke Harper's on that team, and so we asked her to give the play-by-play -play of the animated version. Right now, our aeroshell, which is the upside-down ice cream cone-looking thing, is going to separate from the cruise stage, which is what just happened right there. That cruise stage had uh, solar arrays on it. It was providing us power and everything during the about six-and-a-half-month cruise. At this point, we are reaching the Martian atmosphere, and what you're seeing is our heat shield, which is glorified fancy cork, uh, get hot, and it really insulates the spacecraft. Is this where you start worrying about whether all yeah. this stuff's going to survive? This is it. This is entry right now. There's always a chance that one of those things that needs to happen at the exact right time um, doesn't. And unfortunately, in the case of entry, descent, and landing, you need all those things to happen correctly or your, your mission is done. Nobody's driving this thing anymore, right? Correct. It's this driving is all itself. Doing this is it. all of the programming is driving it's it. It's all on its own. So there's no joysticks, there's no instructions, there's no do this, do that. And in fact, it takes around eight minutes for a command to be sent to the spacecraft. And all of EDL takes between uh, five and a half to seven and a half minutes, depending on atmosphere and mass. And In the business, they just call it seven minutes of terror. So and a the bunch time of other something things. went wrong, you wouldn't find out about exactly. it until it was... Exactly. So we... She's we 29 years old, and being a woman in the space program isn't all that unusual anymore. She says the EDL team was about 50-50 men and women. But she also knows that video has made her something of a role model for girls who are interested in science and engineering. So what's your story? What kind of kid were you? How did you get into this field? Is it something you were early on interested in or that it, you picked it up later? I knew I wanted to do something in the space industry. I, as a kid, I was always looking up at the stars. Um, it, it was always something that I was interested in. Uh, and I decided to go to graduate school, and that was where I really wanted to emphasize in something. And I researched entry, descent, and landing, and Georgia Tech actually had a great program that was very entry, descent, and landing focused, and I fortunately was accepted into that program. Yeah, I really didn't know anything about it until 
2012 and uh, you know, here I am now, 2018, six years later, having just accomplished my first flight project, which was a mission to Mars with entry, descent, and landing. So it's all been a dream that, yeah, if I look at everything in hindsight of my life, it's, it's pretty crazy. One of her jobs as part of the EDL team was to think up worst case scenarios, throw monkey wrenches into the plans, come up with things that could go wrong, and then figure out how Insight would have to respond and hopefully it would respond in a, a manner that we could survive. We go through what we call the hypersonic phase and eventually deploy the parachute, which is what just happened at about 11 kilometers from the ground. After we deploy the, the chute, we deployed our heat shield and uh, our landing legs, which is what just happened. Um, for us as a team, we were very optimistic, but of course there are those what we call unknown unknowns. Mars may throw us a bad weather day and our density prediction may be completely off from what we had estimated and you know that could influence the, the, the flight a lot. Um, and you know, our radar couldn't work or maybe one of our pyros don't actually fire and we never separate from the cruise stage or we never deploy the chute or the chute explodes. I mean, all these things can happen. And do happen. In 2016, the European Space Agency had a very similar landing plan for the Scaparelli spacecraft. And one of the many things that could go wrong did. It entered the atmosphere and they waited for word of touchdown and waited and never heard from it again. A photo taken by a satellite later showed the crash site. Data indicated that when the parachute opened, the craft started spinning faster than its indicators could measure. Then the radar misread the altitude. The chute was released too early. The engines fired, but only for a few seconds, and it plunged to the Martian surface. Two years later, NASA's InSight was beginning its own entry and descent. Telemetry shows the spacecraft saw about eight G. In the room, it's, I mean, you can cut everything with a knife. It's, it's just, everyone is so tense. It's high anxiety, high stress. We've, we're all exhausted from operations and obviously the amount of work that you've poured over years to, to make this uh, a reality and a success. And so but she and her colleague and fellow football fan, Jean Bonfiglio, were confident enough that six weeks before InSight's arrival at Mars, they started planning how they would celebrate success, at least in part to break the tension. We found a video of a touchdown celebration that we thought as engineers we could <laughs> actually try and, and uh, uh, do. Um, when we touched down on Mars, we were ready to, to go through this handshake. Touchdown confirmed. Um, it was not planned that we would actually be the front and center shot on, on the camera feed, but uh, we were, and that's what a lot of publications and media picked up on. So it's been very positive reactions to it, and you know we're just happy to help expose people and engage people in, in what the InSight mission is all about. So it's been really a great experience for both him and I. The EDL team had done its job and then set out to analyze all the data that was sent back. And InSight began its work. NASA said it was about taking Mars vital signs, heat, seismology, geology, probing deep below the surface. But once again, the unexpected a key heat probe that was to be driven some 16 feet below the surface, got down only about a foot and stopped. And NASA, from a very long way away, was trying to fix it. But Brooke Harper's experience, well, she's hooked. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's a lot of work, but it's, you know, like I said, that, that feeling of accomplishment and um, success is something that I, I, I want to feel again, and I feel like doing another mission is really what's, what's gonna provide me that. So my final question is, uh, have you thought about going to Mars yourself? I have. Um, I don't think I'm going to be one of those that will volunteer for one of the, the first or second or even probably 100th mission. I would wait until things are, you know,
very, it, it's, it's a flight from, from here to Kansas City is, is what I'll wait for. But um, I know that there are a lot of people that are eager to, to volunteer for that first mission to Mars. And um, not myself, I think it's very cool. I would maybe do a trip around Earth or go to the moon someday, but uh, I'm not sure Mars is, is in my future for, for myself. But you wouldn't mind helping them get there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That would be a dream if, if, if I were somehow on, on the, the uh, mission that, that would take the first humans to Mars. That would be incredible. Much more terrifying because now, you know, money is one thing, but you, you've got human life. That's, you know, something that you absolutely have to protect and, and be confident that your system is going to work. Yeah, you need a better than 40% chance. Of yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um, that, would, that would be incredible. July 20th of 1969, 50 years ago, we landed on the moon. And on a leg of the lunar lander was a plaque. It's still there. And it was read by Neil Armstrong with Edwin Aldrin standing alongside. Here, man, from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, 50. It seems so low-tech by today's standards, not just the quality of the video, but even perhaps the need for humans to even be there. So much space exploration today is carried out remotely, efficiently, and safely by robots roaming Mars. The New Horizons spacecraft sending back high-definition photos as it speeds past Pluto of all places. The European Space Agency's Rosetta mission landed a probe on a comet and an array of Earth-bound telescopes recorded the first image of a black hole. But for many, if space exploration is going to be a real adventure, real people are going to have to be involved. But those astronauts knew better than most of the rest of us that it was the hundreds, the thousands of people, like those at McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis in the 1960s, that had gotten them there, and then safely brought them home. And that's Living St. Louis. I'm Jim Kircher. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Living St. Louis is made possible by the support of the Mary Rankin Jordan and Eddie A. Jordan Charitable Foundation and by the members of Nine Network.